might start then, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the ACT branch of the AIIA. My name is Heath McMichael and I'm branch president. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay my respects to elders past and present. Now, over the last few years, we've discussed on a number of occasions here in the branch, uh, geostrategic rivalry and emerging threats in the Indo-Pacific region on a number of occasions. <laughs> the focus has generally been on the military capabilities and strategic ambitions of the great powers and their allies, including Australia. Increasingly, however, analysts have been looking critically at emerging constraints on countries in our region. For example, climate change, the trade-offs involved in getting to global zero emissions, growing disparities between rural and urban populations and the digital divide. The focus of tonight's talk is on the constraint of demographic change. In particular, the graying of populations in advanced countries and what used to be called the miracle economies of East Asia. To lead our discussion, we're very fortunate that Dr. Andrew Orris could be with us all the way and just arrived from uh, the United States all the way from Washington College, uh, where he is Professor of Political Science and International Studies. Andrew is a specialist on the international and comparative politics of East Asia and the advanced industrial democracies. He advises policymakers in Washington, Tokyo, Beijing, Berlin, and elsewhere. Andrew has shared his research widely in the print media and with our very own ABC News channel in a report on 14 March this year, I see as well as on the air for the BBC, NPR, CNN, and CCTV. He's working on a book tentatively titled Asia's Aging Security, Aging Power Resilience, and America's Response. And indeed, uh, Andrew's been very prolific in writing books over the years, and we've discovered a couple of these books on Bryce's uh, bookshelves. So looking forward to another one. Now, as per our normal format, uh, Stephen will speak for 20 minutes or so, maybe a bit longer, before we go to questions from participants in-house and uh, from those online using the Q&A function on Zoom. So we aim to finish at 7 p.m. Now, over to Andrew, please. Great, thank you for the generous introduction with props as well. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. It's just my second time to Australia. I'm, I'm struck, uh, second time to Canberra as well. I'm struck by how topographically reminds me of my mother's hometown of San Diego with the, the hills and the foliage. So um, it's, I feel a little, a little nostalgic. Um, I have some slides up here. I'm gonna talk about some demographic data. So sometimes it's nice to see the numbers projected, um, but I wanna try to stay at kind of a top level, uh, give you a preview of the book that's coming out uh, early next year um, and, and take the discussion in ways that you find interesting is the, is the idea. So let me just jump right in. Um, hopefully these will, they were advancing a moment ago. Maybe we'll just do manual advancing. <laughs> uh, right, so, um, sorry, I'm gonna read and talk at the same time here. Um, so overall, as you heard in the introduction, you know, my, my work focuses on um, the demographic implications uh, uh, of, of, excuse me, the security implications of this demographic change. Um, that's that's happening here, and it builds on uh, earlier work that I've done on East Asian security. Um, but I wanted to say up front, obviously, there's a lot of implications beyond security of the rapid aging and shrinking of populations in this region, and we can certainly talk about those things in the Q&A if you'd like. Um, the, the sort of underlying point that I try to get across um, through this project uh, is, is that the changing demographics is a relational issue in security in this region. So it's not just that one country is rapidly aging or population shrinking, but multiple countries are experiencing this while other countries in this region still have robust population growth. So I'm interested in those relational trade-offs and how that affects the security environment. Um, still a little slow on this advancing. Uh, so just in relation to kind of the broader project, uh, this is sort of a, I'm drawing on ideas that, that I wrote about last year in um, the U.S. journal Asia Policy. 
uh, if you want to read a little more about the ideas that I'm explaining today. Um, as, it, as it happens, that issue of Asia Policy last April has a terrific book review roundtable, which is when multiple people review the same book and the author responds uh, for Tom Lee's really excellent book, I think, called Japan's yeah. Aging Peace. And uh, his book, I think, is a great example of what you can do if you do a deep dive in the demographics of a single country. Uh, so I'm doing the sort of trade-off of a 16-country study and looking at those relational considerations. And so I rely on people like Tom Lee, who did the deeper dive on a specific country. And I think I've finalized the, the title for, for my new book because I have to send it to the publisher in about a month, mm -hmm. uh, which is Columbia mm -hmm. University Press. Mm -hmm. It's going to be Asia's Brain Security, Strategies of America's Aging Allies, mm -hmm. Adversaries, and Partners. So that should be out uh, by mid-year next year. I actually was supposed to be sending the final copy at the end of this month but the UN just released new world population data literally last week on World Population Day. And so I'm gonna take the time over the next month to update my data tables for the very latest data. But I have reviewed that data quickly in the last week and I can see that it just underscores the trends that I'm talking about today. It actually, the aging is happening faster uh, than it had been predicted in the 2022 numbers. So all of the numbers I use today are based on the 2022 data. Um, so um, I have sort of three themes I want to share with you in 15 minutes or so. Um, the first is to talk about this major demographic change that's underway. Um, so we have a rapid aging and shrinking of total population sizes is going to be a real trend of the 21st century. Um, unlike the 20th century, where basically everywhere in the world, there was a huge growth in population. So I think for most people our age, uh, that's what we expect, that the population of the world is just going to get more and more. Right, so a really striking figure is that it took all of human history uh, to get to 1.6 billion people on the planet at the beginning of the 20th century, right? And in that 100 years, we added 4.6 billion more people. So that was really the hallmark of the 20th century was that huge population growth, right? So in the 21st century, that growth will end. Uh, and when exactly that will happen in the 21st century is a little unclear. Some people think it may be as early as 2050 or 2060, but definitely before the end of the century, the total global population will begin to decline. Uh, but it will happen much more quickly in, the, in some places in the world, including in this region. And that is going to have big uh, population uh, implications across the board, um, including for security. Um, so this happened because uh, fertility rates fell well below replacement level uh, starting as early as the 1970s. But because that went together with the increasing life expectancy, the effect of that is only being felt basically now. Um, Here's a kind of demographic note. Uh, a, a replacement fertility rate is roughly 2.1 if you look at statistics. So the basic idea is two people in a couple need to produce two more people in order for the population to be stable, right? And a little more than two because unfortunately you sometimes lose children. Um, so the populations in the Indo-Pacific uh, that have already begun to shrink Japan in 2011, um, South Korea and Taiwan in 2020, Russia in 2021, China in 2023. And that's going to just continue across countries in this region. Um, South Korea has the world's lowest fertility rate. Just last month, uh, the president of South Korea declared a population emergency because South Korea has had declining birth rates for over 20 consecutive years now. Um, and there seems to be sort of no end in sight I'll present just one example of this early on and we'll look at a little more data in a moment. But to give an example, you look at the number of 20 year old men. So this is a, a number that's very important in Korea because South Korea has con mandatory military conscription for all young men. So basically all of these 20 year olds will serve in the military. In 1989, there were 500,000 of them. That was the peak. Uh, in 2021, there were 311,000. And in 2040, there'll be about 140,000, all right? And by the way, I'll just point out, this is not a projection uh, so much as a fact because these 
140,000 young men are already born, right? They have nothing to do with the future fertility. So there are not going to be more of them. Uh, so um, if you think of a country that has mandatory cons universal conscription, on the surface, you would see the size of the military declining you know, by about two thirds. In fact, it won't decline quite that much because they're going to rely on volunteers more and try to keep uh, service members longer. But that's a, it's a real serious challenge. Um, and I'll note again at the outset and kind of these big takeaways that the only reason why the US and Australian populations um, and others are not um, shrinking is due to immigration, uh, both new, new people coming into our countries and also because the fertility rate is higher among first generation immigrants than the native born population. Um, so again, just to kind of wrap up the demographic overview. Uh, so we talked about um, the shrinking of population sizes, but then there's also the issue that's the focus of my book, uh, which is about aging and the rapid aging. So rapid aging happens when you have low fertility rates and expanded life expectancies. Uh, and again, if you think about the 20th century, one of the incredible achievements of the 20th century was the dramatic expansion in life expectancy. So we could look at a case, uh, well, you could see uh, here that um, Japan has um, now the world's longest life expectancy, almost 85 years old. It's number one in the world. If you look at the median age in Japan, so here's the aging. It, in 2020, it was 48 years old. Uh, in the US at that time, in 2020, it was 38. And the world, average, the world median in 2020 was 30 years old. So you can see like the Japanese median is 18 years higher than the average. So that's what we mean by an aging population. We can look at the median age, or another common way demographers look at it is to see the percentage of the population that's over 65, assuming that people generally retire at around 65, although that varies. Um, so Japan became what demographers call a super-aged society, the world's first super-aged society in 2005, when 20% of their population hit 65 or over. Um, last year, 30% of Japan's population was 65 or over. Um, and in the meantime, these super-aged societies are going to ripple across the region. So South Korea and Taiwan will become super-aged in this decade. China, Russia, North Korea, all in the 2030s, plus the US, Australia, and a number of others. So I'm trying to kind of think about what are the implications of this? Uh, Here's a kind of summary of that slide. You can see the graph, the line on the, on the color graph there is 2020. So you can see that looking forward, the only continents in the world that will see population growth in the 21st century are, are parts of Africa and parts of Asia, basically Sub-Saharan Africa and um, Western Asia, more or less. Um, and you can see a life expectancy um, shown here, but just to give one example, in China, the life expectancy in 1950 was 44 years old. Uh, and in 2020, it was 78 years old. Uh, so this is an incredible achievement. I and mean, if you want to think about problems, I mean, that's kind of a good problem to have, to have like your life expectancy double. Uh, but it does have a number of implications. That is what I write about. Um, so some people come into this with a very pessimistic point of view, and you're going to see this in the media, that because of changing demographics, we have peak Japan, uh, the title of a book in 2019 by someone I really respect, by the way, Brad Glosserman. I disagree with him, but uh, uh, peak China is a phrase you hear a lot in Washington these days. I'm not sure if you hear it in Canberra, but uh, you know the idea that looking at China's future because primarily with demographics, but other things like, like you know, bank loans and um, governance issues that China is just going to decline as a result. Uh, and I, I disagree. <laughs> uh, so I think the point is, uh, demography is not destiny, <laughs> uh, but it does uh, create certain incentives and, and create a number of challenges. And the question is, uh, as a political scientist and not a demographer, is how does government, how does policy respond to these changes? Does it respond in smart ways? Does it ignore the problem? Uh, does it exacerbate a problem? And what I'm seeing in the first 10 years of Asia's experience with rapid aging is that they're responding generally in pretty smart ways. And so I'm pretty optimistic about what's possible. 
So I'll give you a few examples before we go to Q&A, um, my last book cover. Uh, I had incredible luck uh, with my last research project that um, I was interested in, as many were in my last book, about um, the changes I was seeing in Japanese security policy um, that really came from the beginning of the first administration of Shinzo Abe to then him returning to power and him leaving powers so was a 10 year period from 2006 to 2016 was the focus of this book. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that's exactly the first decade of Japan's super age status. So when I became interested then in writing a book about the effect of super aging, I could say, oh, well, like, actually, let's see. I already have the research in what one super age state did. Uh, another state that's not yet super aged, but is really close there and was having population shrinkage issues, addressed them somewhat, and now population is shrinking again, is Russia. So really two of the first examples of, of rapidly aging international military actors, Japan and Russia, both went against what people expected would happen, which is turning inward, you know, may, paying more attention to like the elderly retirement issues. This is not what we've seen in those two cases. And so I think a lot of people in this region are thinking, well, will China turn more inward and be more concerned about their elderly population as it ages? Will that happen with other states? And I, I don't see a reason to expect that basically. Um, there are reasons for concern, of course, um, with aging. Um, Japan faces a, a serious budget deficit, um, but nevertheless, they've found ways to nearly double defense spending uh, in the last in the last five years. Technically, their defense spending has risen probably about 65%. People often talk about doubling because their goal is to go from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP. But they do that in part by kind of some accounting maneuvers. Uh, so, uh, but still, it's a lot. South Korea as well increased their defense spending a lot just as they're becoming super aged. Um, this is just sort of the retelling now that I've given more context of the challenge of South Korea's military recruitment. Um, is showing these, these numbers of young men dropping. Uh, and the solution South Korea is, is uh, pursuing is to expand volunteer forces, um, to use technology to offset labor, and to expand their cooperation with allies and partners. And you are gonna see this trend across the board, basically. This is what Japan is doing. This is what Australia is doing also. Um, so what about China and the idea of, of peak China? Certainly China faces a number of demographic challenges moving forward. It's exacerbated in China's case because they have this so-called one, chi one child policy from around 1978 until around 2020. And so their, their demographic drop happens very quickly because of that policy change. It doesn't happen as gradually as it did in other countries. Um, so as a result, China's 65 plus population will double <laughs> between 2020 and 2050. So you'll have go from 172 million people age 65 or higher to over 365 million. And what I understand is actually it's quite a bit over based on the newest data projections uh, that were updated, but I don't have that, that data just yet. Um, so what's the... What's the solution to this? I think most, most of you in the room must be thinking, well, what about technology and robots? I've seen Battlestar Galactica. Won't that work, you know, the drones and things? And I think the answer is yes, to a degree. There's no doubt that robotics, other sorts of uncrewed systems, um, including use of artificial intelligence is going to help. Um, there's also a lot of labor-saving design um, possibilities um, that we can borrow, that militaries can borrow from from the private sector. Um, and if you're a country like Japan or South Korea that's facing a really serious um, population shrinkage, it's pretty great luck that you also are among the most uh, technologically advanced countries in the world. So certainly we can expect that, that so that's the good news. But the bad news <laughs> is that these new technologies themselves are altering the nature of the security environment and creating their own security threats. So probably all of us think immediately of cyber because we've had that happen to our own computers. Uh, and so you need labor to deal with cyber 
threats, right? This is one of the biggest shortages right now in the Japanese military is um, trained people in cyber. So all people are not fungible, right? If you can sort of phase out a few tank operators, you can't necessarily make them cyber warriors uh, immediately, right? So, so there's a labor challenge on that side. And similarly, you know, the idea as we look a little towards the future of using more and more um, on, on uncrewed systems and drones to fight in in wars. Of course, that's that saves labor on the one hand, but then people need to build these drones. They need to design these drones. They need to develop strategies. So I'm not saying it's a one to one. I do think there's still labor saving, but exactly what the ratio is, I think, is sort of unknowable. It will probably change over time. Um, so to sum up this first point, and I think about five minutes, so I'm more or less on my own timing here. This is the table from my book that's pretty detailed for this talk, but, but I'll just kind of narrate a few points. This shows change in the Northeast Asian countries from 2010 to 2020. So look at the green column, the change in the 25, uh, excuse me, the 65 plus population, South Korea, 52%, Taiwan, 52%, China, plus 55%. Then Russia plus 20% is aging a little more slowly. Japan was 24% because it aged the decade before. It was the leader in aging. So that's a very big change. So that, again, is kind of what my book is thinking about. What are the implications of that? Many people thought, again, shifting away from defense spending to social spending. But look at the defense spending column in that first decade of rapid aging. South Korea increased defense spending 43%. China increased defense spending at least 89% and probably more depending on the statistics that you use. So that's a bit of a puzzle. Maybe it just will happen for the first decade and that will happen less in the future, maybe, uh, but I'm reporting what we're seeing so far. So big point number two, this effect on military security. So I do believe even though states have managed this transition pretty well and technology is helping so far, uh, it nevertheless has real implications for how security is working in the region. And so these are kind of three top line takeaways. I think you're seeing the region become more multipolar as, it, as a result of the broader demographics that you have more um, wealthy places that are spending more money on defense. Um, so even if you send, spend the same percentage of your GDP on defense, if your GDP doubles, then your defense spending has doubled, right? So you're seeing more um, capable actors. And so as a result of that multipolarity, we're seeing more mini lateral, at least cooperation, like the quad that involves the US, Japan, Australia, and India, AUKUS, which is Australia, the UK, and the US, um, a number of trilateral forums in Washington just recently. We had Japan, the Philippines, and the US, and Japan, South Korea, and the US. Um, so I think that's one aspect of the shifting demographics. Of course, I'm not saying that this is driven only by the demographics, but I'm saying that the demographics contribute to this um, trend. Um, for major powers, technology is being introduced at a record, record pace. Um, this helps manage shrinking workforces, but I do want to be clear that I am not at all saying this is primarily due to demographics, but I am saying that this helps deal with the demographic issues that are emerging. And I, I do am concerned somewhat, I talk in my book about what I call the aging security dilemma, but you have across the region now a whole bunch of powerful countries investing in new military technologies all at once, and so there's a lot of unpredictability in that. You know, so I'm, I'm concerned about that. And then you also have, I, I, we could talk about it in Q&A if you'd like, but I'll just throw out there the reason why I changed the main title of my book from Asia's aging security to Asia's graying security is I wanted to do a bit of a play on words that at the same time that you have graying populations and I'm doing my part with my graying hair, uh, you also have graying conflict, a rise of gray zone conflict, these, these activities between major actors somewhere between war and peace, uh, fighting cyber wars, incurring in each other's territories in ways that don't result in a war. And, and those two things together, I think, are really changing the security environment. So lastly, of course, there are effects 
beyond military security um, that, that will result from this rapid aging. But one that I wanted to highlight that we could talk about more is I think there's a widespread idea that when you have a shrinking population, you'll have a shrinking economy. <laughs> and um, that's just a mistaken idea. Uh, it, it superficially sounds logical, uh, but if you actually, I'm not an economist, I rely on other people's studies, but if you look at what the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank or the USCIA thinks um, the economic size of Japan or South Korea or China is going to be 10 years from now, it is not going to decline <laughs> in proportion to their populations. It's going to increase. We could talk more in Q&A about why that is, but the main point is, as you have older workers retire in still developing economies like South Korea and, and, and China, those older workers were very much less educated. They were less educated than the workers that are replacing them. And they were less healthy than the workers that are replacing them. So you kind of expect that the newer workers are gonna to lead to productivity boosts. Um, so that's a, kind of a top line point. So just to sort of sum up, wrapping up as the header up there. Uh, so I do um, look at 16 cases in the book. I have the data, I built a data set um, of 46 um, countries and territories in the region. And from those, I take 16. I, my book focuses on, on rapid aging. And so there's seven states that are especially in that category. Four are close US security partners, um, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand, and then three are US adversaries, um, China, North Korea, and, and Russia. So um, a, a larger proportion of the book focuses on those countries, but then I have treatments of the other nine. Um, so three are on the verge of being super aged, which is Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. And that will happen in the early 2030s. Um, and six are more youthful, uh, but all are still growing. Um, so these are, these states visualized. So the darker shaded states are the super aging earlier population shrinking ones. And then the lighter colored ones are still growing states. So I mentioned the sort of dual graying idea and the fact that there's differential growth in the Indo-Pacific. So finally, the last two slides are about some of the policy implications to just sort of wrap up. Um, so I think we can say with confidence that the future of conflict among the most advanced states in this region is going to employ fewer human beings and more technology. But again, that's not primarily because of the demographics, but that is going to dovetail nicely with the changing demographics of the region. Um, some US allies and partners already are struggling to fill uh, military manpower quotas um, and to pay for new weapon systems as there's demand for uh, more spending on elderly. This is especially true in Japan and South Korea. But as I'm sure many in this audience know, Australia also has serious recruitment challenges and does not have uh, the same demographic challenges. The US also has big military recruiting challenges right now. So we can't blame that only on, on demographics, but I, that's why I gave you the example of South Korea though, to show that there's something really real there about the demographic challenge. Uh, and the last slide. Uh, so in terms of regional security, um, the security architecture in the region is evolving for lots of reasons. There's lots of, there's lots of uh, explanations for the kind of security changes we're seeing, but my work focuses on what's the demographic part of that. Uh, and I do think it's contributing to uh, a more, more multipolar region and more forms of minilateral cooperation. Um, so that's the kind of the broad overview. We could look at these slides in a little more detail if you'd like, but I'm happy to take the yeah. discussion any way you'd like it. All right. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. That's very comprehensive thank indeed. Uh, we'll, we'll move straight to questions. And while people are thinking thinking about what they might be, I've, I've just got a quick one, which comes from the, one of your latter slides about, um, you mentioned the youthful countries in uh, Southeast Asia. And I'm interested in knowing whether your research has also looked at Pacific countries as well, and uh, that those countries uh, would have wider military options. So I wonder if you'd say a little bit more. Uh, I know you're not yeah. a military uh, strategist or anything, but whether you might uh, 
care to tell us a little bit what that might mean uh, for those youthful societies? Sure. Um, I, I love I love starting with that question because it gives me a chance to have another sort of takeaway point from the book that I didn't yeah. want to cram into 25 minutes. But uh, I think a, another kind of main thing to think about in relation to demographics is that as you think about security cooperation, what makes an attractive security partner or ally, it isn't just about the population, right? It could be about providing um, a logistics hub like Singapore does uh, for the US military. It could be about providing a place for your military to be physically located, right? Like US uh, forward position troops in Japan or, or South Korea, Sometimes. right? So mm. for the case of the Pacific Islands, mm. uh, I think that, uh, well, actually, let me step back and say another another thing that uh, can make a, a, another partner attractive is to keep them from being a partner of someone else. Uh, so you're concerned about you know, geography, for example. Uh, so I think the Pacific Islands fall especially into that category, you know, that the concern is, you know, traditionally Australia has had a kind of special relationship with certain Pacific Islands. Um, the U.S., has with some, right? Um, Japan has with some. Uh, and the concern is China is increasingly interested in some of those islands. And that, that from an American perspective, uh, we see that as a concern or threat. So that makes even a place that has a small population potentially interesting uh, as a place for more security cooperation. Let me also just say related to the Pacific Islands, some Pacific Islands have very, for, for the region, very high population growth. Uh, like they may see a population increase by a, as much as like 40% mm -hmm. to 2050. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's gonna create different sorts of security concerns, especially in combination with climate change that we predict. Um, so we may need to see population movement as a result or increased immigration may happen. Um, so that, in, in terms of the broader point of the question about growing populations, growing populations pose their own sorts of challenges. Uh, so with, with an even bigger country like India, for example, which is, of course, the biggest population country in the world, how India will manage its growing population and whether it will effectively get the younger, new, the larger amount of younger people into productive jobs. Uh, this is what demog demographers call the demographic dividend. Uh, so if you can cash in your demographic dividend, then your economy can really soar, which is what China did. And before that, South Korea and Japan. But many other states haven't done that, right? Like Iran didn't cash in their demographic dividend and their window is closing. Uh, Egypt, the same way, right? So whether India can do that or a Pacific Island country can do that yeah. is something that I think we can offer the United States, Australia can offer based on our experience. Excellent. All right, uh, if people uh, could just let let us know who they are when, uh, first of all, to Bill, thanks. Yeah, well. Uh, we've got a microphone as well we're using today. As always, can you hear me? So yes. as always, uh, an innovative and uh, uh, extremely valuable contribution to uh, the security debate. Um, could you go to the last slide? That would be um, the one before, yeah. I think I can. <laughs> can I'm pushing that? the button. Uh, some assistance coming. Yeah, up. okay. Uh, um, <laughs> look, um, in terms of deepened alliances, many lateral cooperation like the Quad and so forth, uh, I, I want to introduce to you what we call the messiness factor. <laughs> And what we mean by the messiness factor is that uh, it's not really linear, uh, maybe not to the extent that you know one might expect by taking demographic factors and then mm -hmm. uh, essentially applying those. You know, to uh, India, Modi just visited uh, was it uh, Russia? I believe so. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to what extent is that going to affect uh, the Quad's ability, for example, to do technological coordination? Yeah. Um, uh, and, and it's not just that. You could also talk about uh, cultural factors like the uh, Japan-South Korea uh, mm -hmm. dyad. Um, uh, and in fact, in many ways, they're competitors. 
you know, in turn, Australia tried to sell submarines to this country did not unsuccessfully. Korea has established a rather substantial defense industrial base mm -hmm. uh, in Australia uh, and, and Geelong and elsewhere. So um, to what extent can we expect that there would be a coordination uh, between um, uh, the the likely collaborators on, on one hand, notwithstanding the demographics mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the ability to actually produce uh, technology in a way that you're going to get uh, positive outcomes. Uh, and then finally, the cultural factor. Mm -hmm. um, uh, to what extent, I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, you know Japan far better than I do, but um, I'm not sure that the Japanese would actually be uh, willing to, on the basis of uh, population decrease, uh, accept um, Pakistani or Indian high tech people to come in and essentially take charge, mm -hmm. you know, of uh, future Japanese uh, high tech or AI or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that would become a real political issue, notwithstanding the demographic factors uh, involved. So I'll just leave it at that, but I'm very interested in what you might well, there's a few questions there. there and, very, yes, yeah. Um, so why don't I mean, for for sake of time, for right now, let me pick up sort of two two aspects of what I heard you say. But I I appreciate your full comment, and um, and I will say I thought a lot about everything that you said, and I think you'll be pleased at how the full book addresses some of those things. But um, so the cultural factor. I'll start with the cultural factor. Um, you know, one one. Well, maybe I'll say two, two, two sort of quick takes on that. One is about the use of women uh, in the military, but also just in the workforce in general. Um, I see as a great example of cultural uh, challenges and responses to um, the demographic pressure. Right, so an obvious solution to a declining number of of young men <laughs> would be to supplement them with uh, with with women who serve in the military at a much lower rate in all of the countries in in Asia, mm -hmm. and I think basically everywhere in the world. Um, and so I did a number of interviews um, for my project. It was about a four year project. I spent a month in Japan, in South Korea, and in Taiwan, and I'm quite convinced that. There's, there's really no chance that there's going to be a female conscription in South Korea and Taiwan where there is conscription, even though there is in Israel and some Northern European countries. Um, in Japan, um, there is an effort to increase the number of women in the self-defense forces. And that's actually been pretty successful in the last few years. Um, this year, the, the latest data of military recruiting is pretty disappointing to Japan's Ministry of Defense. They only hit about 55% of their target. Um, I've been asking, actually just last week, for the data on the, the women aspect. But in the last few years, um, the amount of female recruits has actually exceeded um, the target for the self-defense forces. So that's an example of, you know, you need a cultural change, right, to, to think about um, how you use women in this society. Um, also, if the flip side of the question about the demographics is what causes the what causes the low fertility rate, and I think that the choices that women make are a big part of that. Um, another part of the culture that you raise is about technology, um, and so how much a society embraces um, a technolo technological alternatives compared to, let's say, immigration or how much they accept the idea of immigration is, yes, is a cultural question as much as a political question. Uh, and that varies by country. Uh, the other part of your question um, that relates to, you know, how likely even minilateral cooperation will be, uh, again, I'll say kind of two things briefly on that. One is that I think one of the very top line points I'd love everyone to take away from this talk <laughs> is that I think that in the 20th century, it was pretty reasonable for international relations theorists not to think about demographics as a variable because all countries had growing populations uh, with large youth populations. I think a top line point is it's now a variable. <laughs> uh, and so I think as you're thinking about likelihoods of certain sorts of multi minilateral or multilateral cooperation um, or certain countries as partners, I think some will seem more attractive than others because of this variable. So if you're just unaware of the variable, I think that's a problem. 
Uh, but then you need to think about, well, what are other factors for cooperation? So the, the second thing I, uh, the second point I'd make related to that basket would be that, um, now where was I going with this? Give me a second, catch up in my brain here. <laughs> um, that that as you as you try to to have more cooperation with the broader range of partners, I think that you need to there needs to be a give and take, right? So I think with India, for example, India has a number of security concerns. Let's say you say the top four security concerns, and then you look at like the U.S. top four security concerns and Australia's top four security concerns. There's more of a mismatch with India, right? And I think as you look to deepen security cooperation with other population growing states like Indonesia, for example, or Vietnam, you have to address that mismatch more. So that's a give and take. Great, thank you. Okay, are there any other questions then? Yes, uh, Margaret, yeah. Uh, Margaret Sainsbury, just a local member. Um, I'm just really interested in the um, relationship between AI and new technology and the democratic. And on our news this evening was the trouble in Bangladesh with, I think they quoted 30 million young unemployed. Mm -hmm. I think Iran has similar problems and you've referred to that. Does that also mean that some of the growing countries are going to have secure internal security problems that will also mean it'll have implications for who you're teaming with. Yes, that's a great question. Again, I'm glad you asked it. It's, a, it's an issue I address a little in the book, mostly to say that's a big basket of issues and it's a big region and my book focuses on rapid aging. So um, the reason why I, I mean, the, the, yeah, the reason why I went from the 48 countries and territories that I define as the Indo-Pacific to 16 <laughs> is that I was looking at countries that are actively contributing to regional security as opposed to countries that are themselves dealing with internal security problems or might need sort of assistance, right? So that cuts out a country like Bangladesh, um, also Pakistan, um, Sri Lanka uh, are, um, growing population countries that already have fairly large populations. So they're important countries in this region. So don't, please don't misunderstand me that way. But that's why um, when I responded to Bill's question about um, the partners, I look at, you know, in terms of population growing places that I think are going to play more role in regional security, Vietnam, the Philippines, Malaysia, India, Indonesia, and Australia as another growing country, <laughs> right? So those those six really come to mind. But I absolutely agree with you that. Um, and let me also say the the little bit of literature that exists, and some of it is great uh, about the global security implications of demographic change, focuses actually on your question, uh, which is how youth bulges can lead to conflict. <laughs> For the real like scholars in the room, you know, we're in the town that has a world-class university at ANU. Uh, if you want to read the really geeky scholar article, I recommend a book by uh, Brooks et al. There's four authors um, in international security from, I think, 2019. It's a great big data study of the link between demographics and and population change. And so they do like a quantitative analysis and they, they find four demographic indicators lead to more conflict. And so it's basically youth bulges. Um, countries that have youth bulges lead to more conflict. And so the, it, it, I use that as a starting point for my book because I say, well, I, I respect that data and the analysis, but how relevant is that analysis to the Indo-Pacific in the 21st century, uh, where there are no high fertility countries anymore at all? So does that mean we're gonna have a zone of peace and some scholars argued that uh, a decade ago when we really had no experience with aging states. So I, I respect that people were thinking outside the box and thinking ahead. And there was this idea of one, one scholar, Mark Haas called it the demographic piece, a play on words of the democratic piece, the demographic piece. Um, a South Korean scholar uh, called it um, 
what did he call it? The geriatric peace. Uh, and both of them had this idea that we're going to create a zone of peace, especially in Northeast Asia, as all of these countries age at the same time. And what we've actually found in the decades since then is a lot more tension, right? And so what I'm trying to do with my book is say, well, what about the aging side? Uh, how are aging powers, because all of the great powers of the world today, except, except India, um, are aging powers. <laughs> They're all going to be super aged states in the next in the next decade. So in a way, it would be awesome if we thought that that was going to create a geriatric peace. <laughs> but I think there are a lot of signs that it's not. And so then I wanted to interrogate more why that was. But again, your question and uh, is is a great one, and there is a literature out there, and that's just not what I'm going to write on. <laughs> yeah, maybe the next book. <laughs> right. So we got any questions on it? That's all right. Okay. Any questions from? Yes, please at the back. Thanks for your presentation, um, Ella Parker here. I have a couple of questions. Um, one, I'm also interested in knowing what you think East Asia's appetite is for immigration generally. Um, and then also, if we're thinking about these countries, which are sort of the next to come in terms of the aging populations like Australia, um, what are the key lessons learned you think we could take on board from countries like Japan that have gone before us? Um, and any things you, any things they've done you think we should potentially avoid? well great two terrific questions thank you um so the first one again allows me to do a little bit more of a dive into a, a point that i make in my book um which is on these demographic so to your immigration question um when we think about demographic projections it's largely based just on three things <laughs> it's based on the fertility rate <laughs> life expectancy and immigration so the, the UN Population Division does us a great service by when they release their data dump, usually once every three years, but they did it a year early this year. Um, they, the, their big spreadsheet they have, is actually has multiple sheets on it. And one sheet assumes a constant fertility rate. And another sheet assumes a variable fertility rate based on their analysis. And another sheet assumes no immigration. And another sheet assumes the immigration rate that's sort of presently there. Uh, and that is, is sort of where my book kind of dives in because I sort of mix some of these assumptions. So I create my own data sheet and, and I'm transparent about that so you can agree with it or not agree with it. Uh, but immigration is a big one because of those three, you know, the fertility rate and life expectancy, of course, those vary over time, but over a long period. But immigration can change immediately, right? We saw that with COVID, for example, uh, that you know it can almost entirely stop in some places. Um, there's a political climate in many Western democracies now uh, that's an anti-immigrant feeling. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's something that I'm very interested in related to um, uh, my project. It's my understanding that, that Australia is somewhat more like Canada in, you know, being a, a, a somewhat smaller total population country that's seeing immigration as a way that it can help with um, slowing the effects of, of rapid aging and also with sort of GDP growth. But actually in the sort of 10 days that I'm here, and I, this is my first day, I, I'm really interested in learning more about that. Um, not a specialist in that, uh, but it's a big factor. And in, in, in Northeast Asia, there has been... Um, Give me a moment to finish the sentence. But there has been a dramatic rise in immigration in South Korea and Japan. It's just that it's from such a very low number, right? Uh, but I mean, it's in in Japan's case. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of guess a number, but I mean, it, it's something like you know, a 300 percent increase, right? Because it's from like less than a million uh, to over three million now. Right, so that's not nothing. <laughs> I mean, that's a very high rate of growth. And the question is, you know, is that rate of growth going to continue? I don't think that it will, uh, but it shows that that level of change is possible. Um, Korea, South Korea did that earlier and there was some pushback in various sectors. So South Korea is facing a, a, some various scandals about illegal immigration or, or undocumented immigration. Um, so I think those signs 
are suggest to me that there's not going to be dramatic increase in immigration in Northeast Asia it, uh, among those three states. Um, let me just remind an audience that may not always think beyond the Indo-Pacific, but if you look at the Persian Gulf states, for example, I mean, you have multiple countries where the, the immigrant workers or, or the guest workers exceed the native born population by a lot, right? So it's not as if that's not possible. <laughs> uh, for China, the issue is different because their population is so large, right? So there's really no realistic way that you're going to bring in like 300 million skilled immigrants, right? I mean, that's just a fact of life, right? Unless you sort of trade with India. Uh, and I think cultural factors like, so it's just not really very possible, right? But for like Taiwan, um, you know, population in like around 24 million, you know, that, that could be more of an option. Uh, I think Japan is increasingly competing with Canada and Australia and the US for skilled immigrants. And from, from the things I read in Japanese, many Japanese feel like they're not competing very well, that even if they did want to have more immigrants, that they'll have trouble competing against Australia and Canada and, and the US. So um, I don't see the numbers changing a lot, but I don't think we should ignore the change that's happened. Um, and just as a quick side, I'll say in, in South Korea, there's a really interesting literature about um, uh, cross-national marriages, um, which are happening at a very high rate among um, younger Koreans. Um, the the other part of your question, if you can remind me. Uh, yeah, it's about lessons learned. Oh, the lessons learned, right. Um, you know, I, I think just briefly what I would say, I'll, I'll fall back on my my original training on Japan. Um, I think that Japan as the first super age state by 20 years, by the way, <laughs> right? I mean, it, it's the only one in the region now and it's gonna be joined soon by South Korea and, and Taiwan. But in my field research in South Korea and Taiwan, I just heard again and again, oh, we saw Japan did this and that worked well. And we saw Japan did that, that didn't seem to go very well. Uh, and so Japan had it kind of hard in negotiating that by themselves, right? But now they have learned a lot of, of lessons. They've developed a lot of useful technologies that can help with aging. And I, I anticipate that that's going to be a growth area of Japan's economy for years to come. I've, I've had some fun tours of, you know, I've strapped on a robotic um, assist to lift things and I've lifted super heavy boxes and it's pretty cool to do that you know so that you can be like my age you know 50 something and you can still you can imagine being a worker in a warehouse and lifting these things all day long without having the same back pains or if you think about the elderly population and and increasingly in demography and and for people who look at you know the non-security implications of aging um, the fastest growing age group in Japan right now is 85 plus. That's the highest rate of growth. And demographers called that group the old, old, <laughs> as opposed to the younger old, right? Uh, and the old, old after 85 have their own sorts of challenges, right? And um, that's where I think technology can really play a role. So I've seen the robots that can very gently lift uh, a frail elderly person out of a bed and put them in a chair, right? And that that is a good substitute to an immigrant worker um, doing that, right? Um, and I've seen the prescription drug dispensing robots at the hospital. The one I saw looked kind of like R2-D2 in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just moved along and you looked at it and with a retinal scan, it saw it was the right person. And then it dispensed the drug and then it watched the person take it. And the argument of the company that developed it is that it's much more accurate than a person is. It doesn't get distracted and it's a labor saving thing. I predict, I'm on camera now, <laughs> I predict that that is going to sell well in a lot of other countries in the future. So those would be just a few examples. Price. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if we do have time, I just want to remind the online audience that uh, that you can actually ask questions. Mm. Um, there are quite a few of you online, so mm. please do. Mm. Uh, look, Andrew, this is extremely important work and incredibly fascinating work. Um, and that's and, a tape. And, <laughs> and, 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 and a huge amount of data collection. I'm really impressed. Um, and I'm really impressed by your description of trying out robotic arms and stuff. And <laughs> I look forward to the anime coming Always out. Always giving the hard work for scholars. <laughs> uh, look, um, 
when you were if you were studying Japan in the 1990s as I was and uh, and early 2000s a lot of the work would have focused on historical memory and some scholars uh Dick Samuels who you well know of course um would have predicted that the Japanese would become more nationalistic uh as the older generation who remembered the war or the, the generation perhaps after the war who remembered it but couldn't do anything about it died out um, and a general pacifism of Japan died out. I wonder if your research has anything to say about that. The other question that I would have is that in Australia we focus a lot on security issues in terms of new technologies like cyber, you know, cyber defense and, uh, and things like that. Um, a lot of your work seems to be about geopolitics. Um, I'm wondering if there is a generational, um, com a generational aspect to how to deal with cyber. Is the fact that we have an aging population, for example, uh, pushing people to think in security more in terms of uh, a traditional security, um, or is that taken? Um, is that is that taken as something that should be mm. should be in consideration by an older generation? Mm. Um, yeah, that's great, great questions. Uh, again, on the first one, I, the, it's an interesting pattern with the audience. The, the first one tends to be like something that the book is actually right on, and uh, <laughs> then uh, a broader question. So um, the first one, uh, I'll note that in the kind of theory chapter, the beginning of the book, I have this messy diagram that I'm hoping a graphic designer is going to help with in the book production phase. But uh, I basically try to show visually, there's like roughly 16 different lines of argument that I can identify in the literature about what people think is going to be the effect of aging, right? And one idea is that there's going to be generational politics, right? Uh, and that when there's generational change, then that's going to change attitudes about security. Another one that relates to attitudes is that some states will treat what they see as aging states differently than, than they would treat states that are more robust. So those are like two different lines of argument. So I test these to the extent I can. The first one is easier to test in democracies because there's a lot of public opinion polling. Um, and so what I find, I do a kind of a deeper dive in Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, right? And then I look at attitudes about specific areas of military security based on, I'm simplify, I, I simplify it in the book because there's a lot of data, in three big age groups, the 65 and over group, the sort of 20 to, I think I do 40, and then like the 40 to 65 group. And what I find is in Japan, there's essentially very little variation in attitudes about security in those three age groups. Uh, but in South Korea and Taiwan, there's, there's a fair amount of variation actually. Um, but in South Korea and Taiwan, the variation of those three generations, if you want to call them generations, those three cohorts, is actually not the same in the two countries. So you'll have to look at the table on that. But what that means, I think the top line takeaway is the idea that you can predict someone's attitudes about security based on their age is just clearly not correct from a cross-cultural perspective. Uh, it might be the case in a specific country at a specific time. So then I think that gets to questions of like historical memory, um, you know, uh, how things are replicated over generations. So my, my, my impression, although I don't do research on this, but my impression is that, for example, in South Korea, um, concerns about Japan's past atrocities, you know, from over 70 years ago are being very well replicated among younger Koreans. That's not something that's likely to just fade out, right? Um, whereas in Japan, I think there's less robust um, transmission of some of that information. And so it may become less resonant. Um, so I think it's a, it, it's, it varies. It links somewhat to Bill's question about, you know, the potential for cooperation. Um, so that was the kind of the first part of your question. And the second part of your question, can you just remind me of the new technologies and whether or not the old. Oh, right. right. So th this is why I ended up going back to what I thought was going to be the original title of my book, which is Asia's graying security, because I wanted to draw out 
the gray zone conflict aspect of Asia's changing security. So I think that um, that's only an aspect of what your question is about, to, but I think it's an important aspect. And so I think there's very widespread understanding across age groups, at least, you know, in terms of like in government, you know, people who are 55 and over and people who are 25 and over, I think they're seeing the same basic security challenges and they're understanding that technology is going to be a very big part of um, solutions. Uh, but um, they're, they're, the, as I said in the slide or showed in the slides, I mean, the technology itself is creating so many new challenges. Um, and by the way, it isn't necessarily like the, how should I say it? Like it, it's also things like hypersonic missiles, right? Which wouldn't seem to have anything to do with demographics, right? But uh, that is gonna change the strategic calculus, right? Or the fact that there's more intermediate range cruise missiles in this region now because international treaties have expired, right? So new strategies need to be developed because of these other things. And so then those may have labor implications, right? So some countries might be disadvantaged by their declining uh, population size in those new technology realms. So I, I, I think there's pretty wide understanding of that. All right, folks, we might uh, draw a line under it there as uh, yeah. well, it doesn't seem that Andrew's uh, been uh, suffering anything from jet lag, but uh, I'd like to thank him for making the effort to come tonight and presenting a very nuanced and informative presentation. I've learned, I've learned a lot of new concepts. So I won't be looking at gray zone conflict in the same way in the future. <laughs> and um, I look uh, forward to seeing more explanations in your book when it comes out. We wish you well with that. Thank you. But uh, in the meantime, as a uh, small memento of your visit to the ACT branch of the AIIA, please uh, take that away. Great. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thanks to the virtual audience. <laughs> That's right. Appreciate it. Before everyone heads off, let me just say the next uh, event of the uh, of the branch is on 30 July. We have Russell Rollison from the University of Melbourne who's coming to tell us about the UN Summit of the Future in New York and a roundtable that's been convened at uh, here in Canberra of interested people, uh, and that might well include yourselves. I've sent, We've sent a note out about it, actually, uh, and uh, this is a, a discussion about... Um, how to deal with looming catastrophe. So, so someone needs to ask him if there's going to be an aging component to the summit. Of the, the exactly on cue, Andrew. Exactly. That's right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.